it's quarter to six in the morning and I've got to get to Blakeney, which is 44 miles, which is quite a long way in my boat. Uh, sadly, my charts run out there, so I'm hoping that when I get to Blakeney, I can get some more charts. If not, I shall have to get a bus to somewhere to get some more charts. I'm going out with the ebb tide. I'm not sure there's that much of it left, but I might as well get underway, otherwise I'll have to wait till about 12 o'clock for the tide to turn again. So. That was where I stayed. They wanted to rush me £12 for the night for nothing, so... At around 40 miles, Great Yarmouth to Blakeney is the longest coastal hop of the journey so far, and with nowhere to hide from the bad weather. But the weather gods are predicting winds to be light and variable, so no problems. The idea is to leave Great Yarmouth on the last of the ebb tide and then turn north, plugging the flood for six hours. Then coasting with the ebb before picking up the remains of the incoming tide to sweep us majestically into Blakeney Harbour, which is the first of the Great North Norfolk sand estuaries. The first part of the journey is along the last of the year as it sweeps through the docks at the back of the town. Yarmouth is rather crushed up on a large spit of sandy stuff. This is the Lydia M, she's a steam trawler, preserved. The Romans had a fort here so that they could control and tax the trade passing through here to the broad system that shoves tentacles of water right inland as far as Norwich and beyond. Good grain, good grass and a perfect transport system. When the Romans came here they found that East Anglia was really popping with industry, commerce and agriculture, so they just had to take the lot over. By the time of the Normans, a thousand years later, Yarmouth was counted as being home to 70 Burgesses, that's freemen. Most would be family men and would have had servants, so that was 70 sizeable households making a living from sailing, fishing and trading. Maybe 400 people, possibly more. A pretty big settlement by the standards of the time. By the 18th century it was a really serious place. Daniel Defoe, yes, that Daniel Defoe, who was really a hack and travel writer, a bit like me, who wrote a no-holds-barred travelogue of Britain. Yarmouth is an ancient town, much older than Norwich, and at present, though not standing on so much ground, yet better built, much more complete, and for wealth, trade and advantage of its situation, infinitely superior to Norwich, thereby upsetting the people of Norwich the finest key in England, if not in Europe, not inferior even to that of Marseille itself. The key is so spacious and wide that in some places tis near 100 yards from the houses to the wharf. So Yarmouth was thriving. At one time it had the largest herring fleet in the world. A thousand boats worked out of Great Yarmouth. Women came down from Scotland to work in the fish factories all along this excellent quay. The town continued to grow and by the First World War it was big enough to be a major target for the Germans. The cowardly German navy bombarded the place from the safety of beyond the North Sea horizon, but the British navy gave them a good kicking so they went away. Then they started to hit where it really hurt. They sent U-boats to sink the ships. In 
During the First World War, the Germans made the best U-boats the world had ever seen. 92 feet long, 10 feet wide, and designed to be split into several sections to be transported by rail. They had a 60 horsepower four-cylinder Daimler that gave them a range of 1,500 miles and a top speed of six knots on the surface. They could dive in 30 seconds and then switch to a 120 horsepower Siemens electric engine and do another 40 miles under the surface at five knots. Bloody impressive engineers, the Germans. Always had been, still are. The German subs did pretty well until the Royal Navy turned up to escort the merchantmen to and from the North Sea. and started bombing the subs out of the water. So the dastardly U-boats turned their attention to the softest targets they could find, the lowest off fishing smack fleet. There were still scores of the 60-foot herring smacks working out of here. The method of attack from submarines was not torpedoes. They were far too expensive to waste on mere fishing boats, so the submarines would surface near the target vessel, threaten the crew with an 8mm deck-mounted machine gun, and tell them to get into the brig and row away. The target would then be boarded and sunk using hand-placed explosives. During the summer of 1915, they sank six of the finest vessels in the Yarmouth Herring Fleet. The fishermen started to get a bit stressed, and besides, Britain needed the protein. So one of the vessels, the Inverlion, was inducted into the Navy and came under the command of a naval officer and three gunners. Down in the hold, on a raising platform, they had a six-pounder at their disposal and a fine selection of the best small arms the military could supply for the fishermen to join in should it come to a shootout. Sure enough, in August 1915, UB-4 surfaced near the Inverlion and demanded that the crew prepare to be boarded. UB-4 came within 30 yards of the fishing vessel before the crew raised the white ensign, jacked the six-pounder up out of its hiding place in the hold and let the Huns have it. With the first shot, they blew the conning tower clear off the UB-4. And while the fishermen were pouring small arms at the submarine, the naval gunners slapped another six rounds at almost point-blank range and down she went with every member of the 14-man crew. It was a harsh act of war. From the German point of view, it looked like a massacre. From the fishermen's point of view, it was revenge for their destroyed livelihoods. But up until then, no fishermen had been killed in submarine attacks. They'd all been given the chance to row safely away. Not a courtesy extended to the Germans. Shortly after this incident, the Germans stopped attacking the fishing fleet and went back to sinking unprotected, unwary or unlucky merchantmen. The town now has 50,000 inhabitants and the docks are still in operation. and getting lots of trade now from the wind farm work, much of it from Siemens, the same company that helped to build the subs. But I drive a German car, so we're all pals together. Incidentally, as sailors, I'm sure you'll have noticed that the pilot boats have a rail around the inside of the deck, as opposed to the more normal position around the outside. I hope I don't have to explain to you why. Then it was out through the narrow entrance. The journey north started. But the weatherman was promising variable but light winds. He was not calling for squalls, one of which hit me as soon as we left the harbour mouth. It's bloody raining. The weatherman hadn't called for rain. It's not supposed to rain. Man, what's up? It's supposed to be a dead calm day. Bloody Nora. 
<laughs> Hope it's the last one. It's not supposed to do this. Anyway, there's great Yama. Got a proper roller coaster. It's a real kind of seaside town. It's even got a kind of water splash thing. But the squall soon passed and I was able to put my passage plan into action. Namely, to stick as close to the shore as I could, following the six foot contour, to keep as much out of the tide as possible. As you go up the coast, Great Yarmouth changes dramatically from a busy working port to a classic east coast kiss me quick seaside town. It's got a theatre, two fun fairs, two piers. building that's turned its back on the sea. What I haven't got today is sunshine. No sunshine in Great Yarmouth. Come on, it's a big warm day. So, it's goodbye to the biggest town I will see until I get to the Humber. I shall miss the broads though, they were wonderful.